and welcome to Need to Know Westford. I'm Kathy Ricketson, LCSW. I'm Beth Morrison, LCSW. And today we're continuing to discuss the upcoming town meeting and the issues that are facing the voters of Westford at that meeting that are so important to the future of the town. We have many very important things on the warrant, and today we're going to discuss the override that will require the taxpayers of Westford to pay more in taxes to support the services that we value here in the town. So today we're going to get into why we're here and what the plan is for the town. So I want to turn it over to Beth, and we're going to introduce our guests. We are joined today with Jamie Holmes, who is from the Yes for Westford group, and then also the Westford School Committee Chair, Valerie Young. So thank you for joining Welcome. us. Welcome. Welcome. Thanks for having we us. We appreciate yep. you being here with us today. So Jamie, if you want to start, just introduce yourself. Tell us you know, how you got involved in the issue and you know, why you're here today. Hi, my name is Jamie Holmes. I am a Westford resident of nearly 40 years. Grew up in Westford, and my husband and I decided we wanted to raise our family here. We live in the NAB area with our five children that are all in the school system right now. Our oldest is 14, and we have, um, and he's a freshman at Neshoba Tech, and we go all the way down to second grade at NAB Nasset. My husband's also a police officer in town. I do try to keep abreast of all the things going on and had heard about the override and budget task force and things that were going on over the last year and was concerned when I heard about our deficit. Alarmed, I guess, would be another good word for it. And I started to ask some questions of, of Valerie and Tom Clay, talking to Dr. Chu off and on to just see where where are we at? Are we, is this real? You know, looking through the budget task force um, report, talking to the members of that, which included Valerie, but also Christina Green and Shana Farnsworth. And after really reviewing all of what I have been able to review um, and talking to many different people, it seems to me that this override would be really important to um, sustain all of the services that we do have in Westford and to make sure that our school system remains intact as we move through this financial crisis that not just us are experiencing. We are dealing with Prop 2.5, which does not afford us to deal with inflation by any means. And I just want to make sure that we are able to keep things the way that they have been for our kids and um, the other townspeople. Thank you. And Valerie, thanks for joining us. Can you introduce yourself and tell us how you're how you've been working on the issue? Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me. I'm on my my fourth year on the school committee and have been serving as chair since last June. I've been in town seven or eight years or so. Um, I have two kids, a fifth grader and a second grader. As vice chair last year, when we were wrapping up our FY24 planning and starting to look at FY25, we saw a lot of the expenses were going to be increasing. We were in negotiations with our largest union, the teachers, um, and saw that they were behind our average benchmark. And so we knew that a lot of the expenses that we would continue our services would outpace our normal tax revenue growth. And so then I was happy to work on the budget task force as a large part of that all summer. Did a lot of rigorous benchmarking and looked at any possible new revenue ideas and really I think hopefully laid the foundation for the information that's available uh, for residents right now to be able to say due diligence was done and that led us to this path of needing an override. We will talk about Prop 2 and a half in a second. This is kind of a part two podcast for us because last week we had Angela Harkness and Sarah Fletcher on regarding the upcoming town meeting. I had asked Angela about Prop 2 and a half at that time. Many of her roles in town have run into Prop 2 and a half over the years. Beth and I are social workers, so we understand that Prop 2 and a half, which is now a 44-year-old law, was passed in Massachusetts in 1980, makes it impossible for the towns to plan for inflation, for cost of living increases, as they really occur over a long period of time. It hinders towns' abilities to have the kind of long-term planning that would make it less stressful when those costs overrun 
what our revenues can be. So that's the background on Prop 2.5. Right now, we're one of several towns facing an override. But I would say it's sort of a rolling process all throughout Massachusetts. There's always towns looking for an override when they realize they're coming into a bottleneck, into the crunch that the that this law has created. So that's where we are right now. And there's no choice in to deal with it. So we've had them in the past. When my children were in school, we faced several overrides. And here we are again. So today we're going to get into it a little bit. And how the town, what the process was that brought us around to this override. So how did we get here? Can we talk more about the budget task force and all the work that that was that entailed? I know you all spent, and it was during the summer when most people are on vacations. Props to you and the committee for you know doing all that hard work over the summer. I just heard about it from the chair of the FinCom, Christina Green, because she was very involved in the committee as well. So we kind of were hearing about it on FinCom, but I know you did a lot of work comparing Westford services to other towns. So can you talk about kind of what you learned in that process? Well, I'll try to keep it short, but it was hours and hours of work over the summer. Like I mentioned, one of the biggest increases we were seeing was coming from paying our classroom teachers an average pay. The town employee health insurance costs have gone up two to three times our projections. We also saw an increase in special education tuition for private schools that has historically grown around 3%, and the state last November allowed it to grow 14%. So we knew that these challenges were going to do a step increase to our expenses, and that Prop 2.5 would not allow our handle that. And so the Budget Task Force was convened. We, I was really glad to hear we opened it up to a couple residence spots, so it wasn't just the same usual faces. We got some fresh voices in there, and we split up into a couple different subcommittees. Some of us worked mostly on benchmarking and comparing our spending to other towns like us. We did a a comprehensive look at our school spending against all of our DART districts, which the state lumps us in with districts that are like us. And And that's so that the students that are served would be similar across all the districts, right? Correct. Yeah, it's based on enrollment and percentage of students with disabilities, percentage of English language learners. So We did that benchmarking and showed that the schools are on the low end of spending in almost every category except for people services, which covers transportation and food service. We also did benchmarking by town department, which gets a little bit more complicated because it's not as apples to apples as the school's reporting structure goes. So some some towns have, you know, dispatches in with police departments or ambulances separate or together, right? So all those made it a little bit more complicated to compare town departments. But we also had a group that looked really extensively at any type of method to increase our revenue from something as little as cell tower rentals to as big as a Prop 2.5 override. And what we learned was that there are efficiencies that all departments can work on and are working on and committed to, but that nothing um, that was out there would help us reach this deficit without a Prop 2.5 override. I think that it's hard for some people to understand when an override comes around, what exactly is at stake. I'm going to just ask Jamie, what is the most pressing issue for you with this override? The most pressing issue for me with the override, if it were not to pass, is that what you mean? Yes. Would be, I think, what would happen to the school system Partially, yes, because I have five children in it, but also once our school system begins to not do well, it's a trickle-down effect that will affect the morale of the teachers that are there. It will affect the people that want to come and work here as our teachers retire. It will affect our home values, ultimately. The reason our home values are what they are is because of the school system. Our investment in our children and our homes are probably our two most important investments, and those will be damaged by not passing this override. Okay, thank you. What would you say, Valerie? As school committee chair, that's my job to advocate and balance that responsibility to taxpayers, staff, and students, and that's absolutely my number one priority right now is passing this override so that we can continue to offer students the same learning experience that they've been enjoying and providing staff with the supports that 
they need to be able to support all the students in front of them. And we should mention that it's not just the school budget that is impacted with cuts. Were the override not to pass, there would be a reduction of two police officers, two firefighters, a reduction of hours at the senior center. Um, I know the senior center is also considering, it's not in this budget, but considering, you know, a fee, more fee-based services. The library would be closed on Sundays. So there's a lot of other town impacts that are not just in the school district. Yes, I think it's important people remember everyone is a stakeholder in this issue. It is in young versus old, school parents versus non-school parents. Every resident really has a stake from early childhood to our elder years. And our senior center, our library, these are all very important to our families at every age. So much value. And so much all value. All of that stuff. And, and I, just to <clears throat> mention what Beth said, the cuts that she's talking about on the town side are drastic to a certain degree in fiscal year 25. But if you look down the road for tw- fiscal year 26 and 27 and 28, we're going to be looking at 20, 20 to 25 public safety people being cut from the budget and an additional 15 or so other town employees not named at this point but but that that is the stark reality of what will happen it won't just be a fiscal year 25 issue it's going to continue through through a long period of time Mm -hmm. that's a question that i had for valerie which is if we get this override then how long do we project that we would be resting on this override I think that's a very common question. People want to hear a promise for how long until this type of crisis happens again. And with the data we have available, the strategy that uses the $6.8 million override to fund the deficit in FY25 of $4.2 million, plus the additional deficit in FY26 and the additional further deficit in FY27. With all of that as a strategy, the override and the stabilization fund would hopefully help balance until FY28. And what we also are projecting to happen over those years is a potential increased revenue from the MBTA multifamily zoning, as well as there's the municipal empowerment law um, legislature that's working its way through the state and would allow towns to increase our meals and lodging taxes and that could help increase our local revenue as well. So we, we do see a, a three-year deficit of about $10 million. This strategy would help to bridge that until the future. That's a very good point you just made. Could you clarify a little bit about the multifamily overlay? Because that will be part two in the afternoon, a town meeting. So explain how that impacts this issue. I'm not an expert in it, unfortunately. I feel like I've my time has been spent on the school budget lately. There is a requirement from the state to build a certain amount of, to allow as of right, a certain amount of units in any community that is adjacent to an MBTA station. I think our number for Westford is not 542. You might want to Google that one. Yeah, that's okay. But I mean, how that will impact our revenue forecast as we're going forward was what I was referring to. So any new development would add to our tax base. So if we have new housing units, then those new residents are adding to our tax bases with their property taxes, with their car excise taxes, with their business of meals and, you know, dollars spent in town. And it could be mixed zoning, right? There could be some commercial pieces. I think depending on the development, it could also be commercial. Yes, I think a lot of planning has gone into mixed use. But as a senior who's downsized, I appreciate that for young families and for people who are retired, like myself, it is, it is important to have an option if you want to stay in Westford and have some housing options that weren't previously avail- available for us. A good variety. A good variety, exactly. That just benefits the town. So now I'm going to actually point a question toward my co-host who sits on the FinCom committee. And I wanted to ask how FinCom came 
to their decision to support the override? So we have had budget hearings since January, December, January. So every Thursday night, we were having uh, different departments come before the committee and talk about their budgets. For the past year. For the past uh, four months or so, okay. so, we've been narrowing down on the numbers and talking to every town department. So every town department was asked questions at these budget hearings that are all publicly available. They're all still on YouTube, so you can go back and watch them. And then along with every meeting, if you go to Westford, the Westford website, you can look at the meeting packets and that will include more questions that were asked and answered by the committee. Because sometimes we get very detailed questions and so we'd like to give those to the departments before the hearing so that they can answer sufficiently um, and have all the information for us during the hearing. So all that information is publicly available and you can watch all the meetings. So I think initially the override amount that was discussed was an $8 million override. And then through more discussions between select board and finance committee, that was lowered to 6.8. So the 6.8 number is a compromise with all the committees working together and reviewing the budget and asking for additional cut. This is a compromise that so it was, was lowered from the original estimate. It was lowered by quite a bit from the original estimate, yes. During these kinds of process for overrides in the past, it does point to all the work on efficiencies that the town is always working on. When there's a hiring freeze, when there's different uh, departments reviewing all of their expenditures. And Valerie, I think that's just ongoing in the school system at all times, right? Can you talk about that? Yes, so I think it's important to remember that in the fall when the normal budget process starts, we were projecting out of the budget task force that the expenses were going to go up. I think it was like $13 million originally. And then the budget makers sit down and say, you know, what's critical? What, what do we absolutely need to try to maintain the same experience for our residents and our students? And we've, we originally were calling that in December like a level service budget with, you know, with air quotes. But we ultimately settled. And that, that process to get to a level service budget includes some regular regular um, adjustments every year. So we look at our declining enrollment and we ad adjust based on sections of students and adjust, reduce a classroom teacher when we can. We also looked for efficiencies in our special education in district transportation. We realized that we were spending more to have that service in-house. And so we started the process to outsource that. We also are making an, a, an investment in our students ages 18 to 22 by by offering a program for those students to receive their special education services in district as opposed to the costly out of district tuitions that can come along with programs like that. So that kind of work that happens in the fall was, was what helped us bring down some of the numbers to, for our budget projections. And then as Beth was saying, over the FinCom reviews and our public hearings, we were able to hear from the community that original override projections were too high and, and a lot for taxpayers. I think jointly we, you know, as the select board, the finance committee and the school committee really tried to wrestle with what we come up, what we would call a compromise budget so that it is really a shared burden between taxpayers and budget makers to say, you know, here is what we think is the most critical to ask for from the taxpayers to support. And it's worth mentioning, too, that there are planned reductions in the next two years as as part of the, even with the override being successful, that we would reduce, as jointly as schools and towns, we would reduce a total of $700,000 in FY26 and then a further $1.1 million in FY27. So that we, we do know that these expense increases is a lot to ask for the taxpayers to shoulder by themselves. So we are hoping to approach this as a joint effort. Well, that brings us back to Jamie, because you became aware of all of this, and then you decided to take some action. So tell us what you've done. I spoke with Valerie amongst all my peppering of questions and potentially some accusations of what went wrong, why why did this happen? And then coming around to realizing like, this isn't, this isn't just a Westford problem. This is a, a statewide problem. And there needs to be work done to fix that, but what can we do here in Westford? And so she told me about the Vote Yes Committee that was forming, for the Vote Yes for the Override Committee that was forming, and invited me to join um, a meeting. And 
I started to join their meetings and quickly became slightly obsessed with the information that was coming out. Um, and just, you know, really, really looking at what, what I could do to make sure people understand. I think a big part of our problem, and I don't mean our problem, but I think we all don't really understand all of these things, right? We, you know, right. I can remember being a young 22-year-old, having money and buy, getting a mortgage and not having a clue what that meant, right? And making decisions back then that I would never make now because I, I understand it better, right? And the same goes for a tax bill or the way a budget works. And especially municipal budget, because it's not like... Yep. Exactly. Your household budget. Right. Exactly. It's completely different. And there's so many mandates from the state. You know, it's so it's you can't really view it the Things same you have way. No as, choice about. Right. You mm-hmm. have to spend money on. I mean, and, you know, not not to pick on special ed. I have a special education student, but those costs are, are exorbitant. And that's not how we get paid back by the state. You know, for you, you have to provide these services, which I 100 percent agree with, but they're not they're not matched, right? And there's just so many layers. And I really truly feel similar to what you have said is that Prop two and a half has really set our towns up to fail amongst other things that they do. But the state has really set the towns up to fail with this. It gave us the mechanism to override the statute. So there was this fail safe of an override, but it's such an incredibly stressful process that people don't understand. Understand. I think it's hard too because people hear override and associated with so many things, right? Override does not, like you said, it's supposed to be a tool. It does not mean, it's it's not a bad word. It does not mean that there was mismanagement of funds. It does not right. mean that, it, it, and in some communities, it might mean that they want to add a service, right? Or that like something new and and that they value, they're, that they're adding to their, their community. But this override for Westford is really to just continue our experiences and there's nothing new that we are trying to it stabilizes right. sta- the yeah. services for the town yeah. <clears throat> at all levels well i think that what people need to know is that the vote is coming up at town meeting and we can explain the process once again that should the override pass then it goes to the may 7th town election where voters will get to vote on it at the voting booth if it doesn't pass, then what happens? It um, it still goes on the May seventh. So 7th ballot. yeah, I think a town <clears throat> meeting will have two budgets, and so we we will be discussing and passing both budgets with an override and without an override, and then depending on what happens on the ballot, you know, because we right. can't, the town can't be without a budget, and we have to pass some budget at town meeting. So if we were to pass the override budget, and then the ballot would fail, we would have no budget, we'd have to go back to town meeting. So as a fail safe, there will be two budgets at town meeting. And I think we to discuss this with we our moderator. With, with and there's also a stabilization mm-hmm. fund that will be at town meeting that needs to be funded as well. So all those so the process is we would have a town meeting, we would need to pass the budget and the stabilization fund and fund the budget and fund the stabilization fund at town meeting and then on May 7th, which is our town elections, along with voting for our town officials, we will also have a question on the ballot for the override. So depending, so it would need to pass both at town meeting and on the ballot. If it were to fail at town meeting in March, and then pass on the ballot, I believe they could bring another special town meeting meeting. to propose it again at a town meeting. But if it fails at the ballot, I think that we would continue with a non-override budget, which would include the impacts that we discussed earlier, which would be loss of our intervention services at the school district, you know, loss of staff, loss of public safety officers, you know, loss of... Do we have a projection on how many positions we think that would be within the town? So in FY25, in the schools, it's 50 instructional staff, including 30 interventionists, which if you're not familiar with recent education experiences, those are supports in our classrooms for students who uh, need small group or one-on-one direct instruction to keep up with their grade level standard work. On the town side, I think it's five public safety staff members and some other, and the sustainability coordinator would be reduced, and then some reduced hours at the senior center and the library those are just the fy25 impacts um like i said over over three years it's 10 million dollars of deficit so 
whatever we lose in FY25, we would be start our budget process in the fall for FY26 and have to make additional cuts, $3.7 million. And the cumulative number of staff members between fiscal year 25 and fiscal year 27 is 100 at the school and 40 on the town side. And 25, I believe 25 is the number that of the 40 would be public safety. So no. one, one thing I hear when we talk about those projections is that it's a threat or a scare tactic. I guess all I would answer there is that gov- municipal government and schools are, are people services. They're, they are staffed by, you know, the budgets are made out of 80% staff. And so you, there's just no mathematical way to close deficits of this magnitude without impacting staff. So it's right. they, they are projections, but I don't see how we would be able to close deficits of this size without impacting greatly impacting our personnel. And I also want to point out that a lot of these staff positions bring in grants to the town, especially the health department, the senior center, even the police department brings in grants. There's a lot of grant funding that is not, you know, in our budget that we're not going to receive because we're not going to have the staff to administer those grants in place. And the sustainability coordinator is another example where, you know, she's done a fabulous job of bringing in funding. And we have, you know, federal infrastructure money that's going to be rolling out. And that will be a lot of grant funding opportunities that we're going to miss out on because we're not going to have the staff to administer that. Right. Whenever you have, you know, matching funds, whenever you have federal grant money or anything else from the state, it's essential that we have the people in place to get that money for us. And Westford's had a strong record on that over the, over the years that I've lived here. I think that the fact that people are so worried, going to the different websites, going to the FinCom, going to the town website, seeing what, what the reports are there, allows you to get many of your questions answered. People, uh, come to town meeting and they have a lot of questions, but if you don't want to be on a line of 100 people, you can get your questions answered many times. Do your research. Do your research. (laughs) And, you know, even print out some of these things. But there are, there's so much information to inform the voters about this decision. So much work went into it. And, you know, we always have to say, by our volunteer committees, that people who serve on our school committee, our select board, our FinCom, our volunteers. It is amazing the quality of our personnel on our committees in Westford, I just have to say. So I just wanted to touch on a couple of like misinformation that I've been hearing out there and myths. So I wonder if we could talk about the difference between excluded debt and an override, because that's been coming up a lot. And especially the, the library funding, the library plan that we voted on, I think, in 2019. I don't remember the exact and, year. And 20, 2022. 2022. Yes. And then last fall. So there's been some questions about can we repeal that and then use that money to fund this deficit. So I don't know if, Valerie, if you could. Uh, I'll start quickly, but I think Jamie has a great way of explaining some of the stuff in plain speak. Because <laughs> I, I do know that the longer you sort of hold on to these roles, you start to have this town speak and in government speak but and i think and and i want to acknowledge that i think it can be frustrating when someone hears well that there are different buckets of money but it's true you you can't just move things around like you might at home you can't move things around and put them towards salaries a lot of times so so the library is so excluded debt you're asking about with the the way the excluded debt works it's something that is completely separate and actually somebody mentioned even that there might be some confusion from people that things like excluded debt gets voted on a lot at town meeting or a special town meeting. That's not an override, right? That's that's excluded debt that comes that is a loan that's serviced over twenty to thirty years, depending on It's like you know, a mortgage. Exactly. Anyway. Very yeah. much like a mortgage. And so as debt falls off, we usually make choices as a town, at a town meeting, to approve more of it. The past things have been the, the, schools. the schools. We just finished paying for, I think, Stony Brook, Miller, and Chrysofoli. And that was kind of 
where the idea came like, okay, that all just came off. Let's let's finally put this money into our library, which already needs money to be put into it, but we got this great grant. Yes, We've been do- doing this process since 2012. So this would be the time where we decide we're gonna take on more debt now that all this other to debt has fallen on. To take advantage of the other money that will that come fa- in with it. Yes, exactly. So that excluded debt is completely separate from your tax bill. The the override amount will never affect that. That is only affected by the loans that are serviced on it, <clears throat> which at this juncture will be the library, which hasn't ramped up yet. That will that will ease in as as the loans released and the work starts and is completed. I think the senior center still has some excluded debt on it. The, One of the fire stations. Yep, the big fire station. The big fire, the fire station, station has some excluded debt on it. And then the Blanchard roof is on there as right, well. That we voted on that last we time. voted on last time. Right. So that is completely completely separate from the override. I understand it is still an addition to your tax bill, but we did do a little math equation, I think, on that, that I, it figures for the average household that you pay about $150 a year on that. The average assessed house value pay about $150 a year on all of those loans collectively. Yeah, I, I'm always uh, take note at town meeting when they tell us one of those debts has closed out. And it's really, if you remember the original vote for those schools, it's amazing to see that it's come do its past and it's worth mentioning too that you know sometimes people might say like okay well if that project's coming off let's lower our taxes but the good management of towns is based on continually investing in your infrastructure and like our conversation earlier about letting things become a crisis that's how we can try to continue to support our our public buildings and keep them up in, in good standing. right? And, and I think it plays into our bond rating as well. Yes, that- it is a factor in our bond weight rating so that we can, when we go to fund, to borrow. borrow loans, we get a much lower rate. Right. And um, bond be- rating is one of those things that sounds stuffy, right? But it's what- but It's very important. It, it's get looks, it gets looked at by the banks that are offering these loans to us and we get a lower rate. So it does ultimately- balance out a little bit and save us. And I think those are the things we can relate to in our own lives, because we know if we have a good credit rating, we can get a loan and a better rate. And we also know when we pay off our mortgage for our house, that our house still needs maintenance and we still need to keep it up and replace the roof when necessary and so forth, even if we have paid off that mortgage. So, And the other funding mechanism that we have in town for infrastructure projects is the CPA, which I think Kathy was here for, for the Yes. And when that, we adopted the CPA funding. Yes. And uh, that that's a completely different thing that gets paid for out of... It's a surtax, sur- surtax. on your property. So it's an additional 3% on property tax. After yes. the first 100,000. After, yeah. After the first 100,000, yes. And that C, those CPA funds have benefited the town in numerous ways, and you know. And we have a forty percent return from the state funding back on those investments, so it's been a very good investment for the town. Yes, it has, and it's created more quality of life uh, projects for the town that that we all appreciate. Uh, and affordable rec, housing, rec department affordable recreation. housing, the things that give vibrancy to our life in the town. So I that, have a couple stats too that we've like pointed out that that I've researched because I was also concerned about CPA and you know that piece how that factors in and when it was originally adopted it was 100% right it wasn't just the 40% which 40% is still amazing but 100% is really amazing in 2023 the town share was 2.5 million and the state match was 934,000. So I don't really know anywhere else where you can get that type of invest return on your investment that I that I'm aware of yet. Exactly. <laughs> I'd like to find it. But and then also what you spoke of like the the things that we're receiving in town this is avoiding putting a lot of things on our excluded debt, right? So things that we would have gone to capital and said, hey, we're looking for a new playground at Robinson and new te- tennis courts. We need to add this to the the capital projects list. They're going to need to go, you know, it's nearly a million dollars to to fund that. That's going to have to become a loan and you're going to spend money on that loan. This That project get, got to go to CPA, be fully funded, no loan, and it was on half 
half of the money was in, was from the match from the state. It, it just is when you can look at it like that and really realize like the value of it. It it really changes your your purview on it. At least for me, because I I was feeling frustrated by that for a little while too. Yes, until you understand it and all the work that goes into seeing that the investment gets maximized in so many ways. And then the whole town, again, every person is a stakeholder in any recreational project that we do, and it, it's important. I think it's helpful, too, to think about, like, Jamie's a great example of actually approaching something with genuine curiosity, right? And we, we see too often people's feelings about institutions or authority can sometimes trickle down into how they react to local government and a mistrust of local government. And I know on the schools, sometimes we feel like we just don't get the benefit of the doubt anymore, whereas maybe another generation ago or maybe pre-COVID, people would see a decision made and trust that good intentions were were put into it and that due diligence was put into it and say, okay, maybe I don't love the outcome, but I know that you know, good people are working on this. And so um, hap- like our, our information, how to reach us is, uh, as elected officials is on the websites and we're happy to sit down and help bring someone along with the, the facts and the stories to help figure out, you know, what, what are the conversations and the choices that the town is facing. I think that's such a good point. If you take the time to watch the ongoing meetings even now, if you go back and you look at some of the meetings, over a period of years, you can see that they're planning for what's coming on the horizon. And it's everyone is aware that there can be bottlenecks when you know it outpaces revenue. And this is the system that we have. So if you take a deeper dive, like you were saying, on, on those tennis court projects, at face value, it seems, oh, What's that about? But on second look, you realize how clever the town has been and how hard everyone's worked on that to make sure that we can, you know, get that back and still enjoy that investment for the town. Well, we do have a consensus, I think, coming into this town meeting. We the override is supported by the select board, by the finance committee, by the school committee, right, Valerie? Correct. And it does seem that the town is is coming together. But people are worried, and we encourage them to come to town meeting and to be heard and to hear the presentations that are made. And also, I wanted to point out that there are help for seniors and low-income veterans and seniors in town who could use some support with um, paying for property taxes. So I know the assessor's office and the uh, senior center can help you um, with those programs. I'm not going to go into detail of all of them, but there's tax deferment plans and there are some work plans where you can, you know, work for the town offering some clerical like volunteer, services, yeah. volunteer, mm-hmm. and then get a deduction on your property taxes. So there are some helpful things for community members who are concerned about the costs. Yes, if they're worried, they know where they can turn to for help. And and I would say we do have a supportive community in, with programs outside of property tax relief, right? Yeah, they're, you know, St. Vincent de Paul is very helpful in these, in when people fall on hard times. Westford Remembers is another organization that tries to help as much as they can. I'd point out just because you mentioned Senior Center, that also is where the um, social worker is. So that's not just for seniors. The social worker is that's for right. low-income housing. She is the town social yeah, worker. So she, yeah, so she, yeah, so she might be in this in the senior center but i do think that that is a missed opportunity for a lot of people they don't realize that they can access her we have an excellent town social worker yes. uh, allison christopher who is at this uh, her office is at the senior center you know she can help out with the additional t- programs you know there's fuel assistance you know there's food in, assistance. Th- there's food assistance there's uh, programs through the state that she can refer to Again, this it is not lost on me that this is not the same that this is not the same struggle for me as it, it, it may be for somebody else in town to to have an increase. And there are things available and you know, there are people that are willing to to help them access those things. Yes. And I think I don't think anybody sets out wanting to pay more in taxes, right? Nope. Even you know, those of us who have dug into the data and come to this conclusion, I personally, you know, would rather keep my bill the same. But I think there's also a cost to not acting. You know, some of the supports that we are looking at losing in the classroom 
could ultimately turn into further special education referrals and special education services too, which could be more costly. So, and, and like the point you made earlier about property values and maintaining the desirability of the community that we live in, there, there is a cost to maintaining that. And that's the choice that's facing voters. Yes, this is the system that we have in Massachusetts. We could uh, advocate for a better system with our legislators and uh, wish that they would come up with a new way of finding funding for our towns. So that's uh, another cause for another day. If there's anything else you would like to add or you would like people Or how to, can people get more involved? Or how people can get more involved, yes. Sure, yeah. So we're working with the Vote Yes Committee. I'm working with the Vote Yes Committee for Westford and to um, sustain our services. We have a website, Vote Yes for Westford, Facebook page. We also are looking for people that are interested in helping us get the word out. And, you know, that's in the form of handing out some literature at different points, (coughs) um, hosting a yard sign, especially if you have a great visibility spot. Just making sure you tell your your friends and neighbors that to get out to town meeting on March 23rd, we know it's not easy to give up a Saturday morning. Um, We're hopeful that March is a little bit easier for people uh, as a mother of five kids. No, no mornings easy for me. No, no full Saturdays easy for me. I can completely sympathize with anybody that's feeling that. It is definitely very important that if it's something you care about, I know that I have had this mentality in years past where I'm like, oh, don't worry about it. Somebody else is going to take care of that vote. I don't have to get there. It's not important for me to be there. It is absolutely important for you to be there. Voting yes on Articles 1, 2, and 3, that would be in support of the override and stabilization fund and making sure that we can can sustain our services and enjoy Westford and making sure our children have the same same valued education and safety that they have that we all have been and enjoying. that we've depended upon yes so we'll review a little bit from our last week's podcast that there is child care available if you register for it but i think also neighborhood and formal child care if you get together with your neighbors and say let's make sure that as many of us can attend as possible mm-hmm. There is transportation available uh, to the town meeting. There will be three parking lots that are available at Westford Academy, Chris Afuli, and the Robinson School. The town will be running four buses, two D buses, regular buses, shuttling people back and forth, and two uh, Council on Aging buses. So if you have mobility issues, you will have an accessible bus to get from those parking lots to the town meeting. So the town has worked very, very hard to make this meeting accessible. They have preparations for large numbers of residents to come out for the town meeting. Angela stressed, get there early. It starts at 9 a.m., but she recommends you get there at 8 and park and register and get in the hall. And talking to your neighbors, getting people to understand that this is a very important town meeting, I think is critical Very often we think maybe that doesn't affect me at my age so much or, you know, my kids are out of the school system. The point that we're trying to make is that every resident is a stakeholder from our early years to our later years in the town budget and this particular override. Also, in the afternoon, they will be talking about the multi-family housing initiative. And again, that's a part of the big picture here. So pay attention to everything that's going to be presented at town meeting and make sure your voice is heard. And then we need to make sure to vote again on May 7th for the yes. town elections as well. 100%. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Massachusetts breaks up our elections into several different elections. So uh, we have to go out and vote each time. And, and we're not the only community that will be active in voting that have big votes this spring. Acton is facing a $6.6 million override. Groton is facing a $5.5 million override. And Belmont is asking for $8 million. Wow. So Westford is just facing the same expense increases that other communities are also facing. And there could be other towns because we have one of the earliest town meetings. So a lot of other towns are still kind of going through their budget process and yes. might not be... Haven't created the warrant yet. Haven't been they're not at that situation yet where they can officially ask for an override. So there could be other communities that are, you know, identified as having override on the ballot as well. I will say that speaking to that point, I think it was so instrumental that people recognize that there were 
budget issues at the end of well at the beginning of last of the last fiscal year and creating the budget task force and starting these meetings so we you know we really did have time to assess more than we would have if we didn't discover this until you know February 1st when when some people are discovering that so I, I do give a big credit to the town and the committees that that did put that you know those wheels in motion went once as soon as they did realize it and and making that those things start to happen and everything is available on the town website so if you want to review the town budget the fincom book is also available it is available in print as well it used to be mailed out to every household but now you just get a postcard with the information about town meeting on it and then you can access the finance committee book on the website or it's printed in small quantities at town hall the library the senior center and maybe the police station i'm not i think um, so i think so yeah i'm not sure i just saw ta- I, and I if saw you would like the- if you can't find a copy and you would like to request a copy you can always call town hall and ask them you know to give you a copy of the and they they will do that for you. So if you're not able to access it on the website. But the FinCom book includes an overview of the entire budget. Every department is broken down. And there is also at the beginning a summary. So if you just want to read the summary and not go into every department, that's a good place to start is uh, the summary that at the so beginning. Helpful. That is so helpful. Yes. We Great. know not everybody can dive in as much right as, as everybody else. So, you know, summaries are sometimes just where we're at and I think that's some of the the communication information that we're seeing on social media to try to just lay out some facts and let families make the decision that's right for them but to to have everybody at least armed with the proper information Mm -hmm. okay well I think we've covered everything we need to know about the upcoming town meeting and the budget override we thank you so much for being here and I thank all three of you for your volunteer service to the town and for bringing this issue to the front that for the voters so that they can understand all the care, all the time, all the difficult deliberations that it took to get us to this point. So don't miss town meeting. See you there. See you there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.